Hey, thank you so much for joining this morning. Uh, my name is Josh Walney, and I'm a project manager at Secure World Foundation. And today I'll be moderating this webinar about small satellites and space weather. Briefly, I'll say that space, uh, Secure World Foundation is a private operating foundation that focuses on the long-term, sustainable, peaceful uses of outer space. And our work, uh, Secure World, spans many different parts of the space community, from national security to space applications, exploration, and to where we are today at the juncture of scientific space weather and the burgeoning small satellite community. So this event was originally going to be held in person at the Small Satellite Conference in Utah. So I want to welcome all those small sat attendees and say that we hope to connect with you here today, but also hope to connect with you in person next year. <laughs> um, so with that, briefly, I'll go over our agenda and introduce our speakers, and then we'll get into it. So, uh, we're going through the intro right now, then we'll have about 10 minute, four 10 minute panelist presentations, and we'll then come to a question and answer period at the end. Like I said, my name is Josh Walney. I'm a project manager at Secure World Foundation. Our first speaker will be uh, Tom Berger, who is the executive director of the Space Weather Technology Research Edu and Education Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. Tom is a solar physicist by training with degrees in mechanical engineering and astrophysics from Stanford University. He previously worked at Lockheed Martin Solar and Astrophysics Laboratory in Palo Alto, California, where he was a co-investigator for the Japanese, US, UK, Hinode mission that launched in 2006. Tom was also a project scientist for the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope at the National Solar Observatory and the director of NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center from 2014 to 2017 before coming to CU Boulder and leading the Space Weather Trek program. Our second speaker will be Sean Brunsma, who is a geodesist by training, and he got his PhD in aerospace sciences, both at the Technical University of Delft, Delft in the Netherlands. He was a research engineer at the Service de Ronde from 1998 to 1999, where he started upper atmospheric modeling. And then since 2000, he has worked at the French space agency, CNES, on topics such as precise orbit determination, satellite drag, modeling, and space weather. Our third speaker will be Janet Green. Janet realized, or specializes in understanding the damaging effects of space weather on satellites. She received her PhD in space physics from UCLA, where she studied the physics that controls the radiation environment that surrounds Earth. She spent almost 10 years at NOAA, where she led satellite anomaly investigations, monitored the radiation data from NOAA satellites, and developed products and tools for assessing the real-time radiation hazards. She now continues this work at, on the radiation environment and its hazards as a founding owner of Space Hazards Application. And lastly is Matt Angling. Matt is the Ionospheric Program Lead for Spire Global. Previously, he was a Kinetic Fellow and then the Royal Academy of Engineering and Defense Science and Technology Laboratory Professor in Space Environment and Radio Engineering at the University of Birmingham. In all of these roles, he was focused his focus has been understanding and mitigating the impact of ionospheric space weather on communications, navigation, radar, and other RF systems. So thank you to my panelists for joining me. And I will just go over one more bit of housekeeping, which is how to ask questions in Zoom here. I'm sure we're all experts at this point, but uh, just to go over it, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, if you're an attendee, there's a button that says Q&A. And so if you have a question, your first step is to click that button and it will bring up a separate window for question and answer. And so look and see, you can see other questions that have been asked. You can upvote questions. You can't downvote at this point. We'll see if they put that into the future use, but right now you can upvote questions. And um, then if you, if you don't see a question that's already been asked, your question, you can answer it. Keep it short and simple, please. I will be moderating these throughout. And at the end, we'll try to get as many as possible. So with that, Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, let me just do a, an audience check. We're at about 140 people. So greetings to all of you who joined us after I started. And now I'll pass it off to Tom for an intro about what space weather is. And thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Josh. Audio check. Can you hear me? Sounding good. Great. Uh, thank you very much to everyone for attending today. I'm uh, Dr. Tom Berger, as Josh said, uh, from the University of Colorado. And in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right ahead to um, our next slide, if I can. Did you give me the mouse, Josh? I did. I'll start you there and see if that picks up. 
Okay, there we go. So just very quickly, for the purposes of this conference, where we're talking mostly about satellites in orbit, um, we're going to be defining space weather as the variation of photon radiation, charged particle radiation, which is basically electrons, protons, and energetic ions, and magnetic fields, plasma density, and upper atmospheric composition in near-Earth space. <clears throat> and by near-Earth space, we mean, again, all orbits basically from LEO to GEO, all the way out to cis-lunar, where there's going to be increasing activity in the next decade or so, we think. And space weather, this variation in all these physical parameters is really caused by two major interactions. One, the interaction of the Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere with outputs from the sun, and the other from propagating disturbances from the lower atmosphere, which actually can make their way up into near Earth space. So this talk will be broken down into those two pieces. We'll start by talking about the sun and how it influences the Earth's environment. And then we'll end briefly with a discussion of the lower atmosphere and its propagating disturbances, which we sometimes refer to as space weather from below. So moving right along here, we have the sun is a magnetic star. So this is really the key to why the sun creates space weather in our, in our uh, planetary system. The magnetic field can be seen in general when you look at the sunspot, when you look at the sun in white light, for instance, you see sunspots, these dark regions on the sun. If you then measure the magnetic field of the sun and take what we call a magnetogram or a picture of the magnetic field, you see that sunspots are actually these very intense magnetic fields. Black is negative polarity in this case, white positive polarity, opposite polarities interacting very closely to create these sunspots. And where you see um, opposite polarity magnetic fields interacting, you can get magnetic reconnection and therefore activity in the form of eruptions and flares and CMEs. And so we'll talk a little bit about those, but first it's important to know that the sun goes through a magnetic cycle. Every 11 years or so, the number of sunspots peaks and then wanes uh, over this regularity, which has occurred now for 25 numbered cycles with cycle uh, number one in about 1760. We've gone through cycle 24. We are right now, as you can see around 2020, just at the beginning of cycle 25, as we call it. Uh, we're starting to see this, uh, the first sunspots from cycle 25. What you see on the plot there for cycle 25 are predictions, which show that we don't expect it to be much stronger than cycle 24, which was a fairly weak cycle. But these are just predictions predicting the solar cycle and the strength of each uh, sunspot cycle has uh, its vagaries and we're not really sure what we're gonna get for cycle 25. So anyway, it's important to know that every 11 years you get this peak, we're heading towards the peak in about three to four to five years of cycle 25. Right now it's very quiet. Um, looking ahead, we see that, um, whoops, let's go back, sorry. So what does the magnetic field of the sun do? The main thing it does is that it heats the outer atmosphere of the sun. The sun's surface is about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. The outer atmosphere of the sun, or the corona, as you see on the left there, is about a million degrees. So the magnetic field churning through the atmosphere of the sun heats the outer corona to about a million degrees. This in turn causes a solar wind to constantly flow out from the sun. Oops, now we're Sorry about that again, trying to start this movie here. Oh well, that movie was the solar wind flowing out from the sun. The other thing that the magnetic field does is it builds up a lot of energy in those sunspot active regions, which eventually can erupt in the form of very large, what we call magnetic eruptions. And those magnetic eruptions are the, are the, the major things we call, um, that they cause photonic output in the form of flares, uh, those, those flares can send out both x-rays, extreme ultraviolet uh, radiation, and we classify flares briefly in these sort of A, B, C, M, and X um, logarithmic scales that you see on the right. These are measured by the NOAA GOES um, satellites and reported when they occur by the Space Weather Prediction Center here in Boulder on that scale. So not only does the solar magnetic field heat the outer atmosphere, but it occasionally gets uh, in these sunspot active regions, gets twisted up into uh, very energetic uh, configurations, which then erupt in the form of these magnetic eruptions, causing both X-ray flares, 
and uh, as you'll see, coronal mass ejections. The X-ray flares, however, are uh, the main cause of radio absorption in the ionosphere. So when those big flares go off, they send out a lot of X-rays and a lot of extreme ultraviolet light. That in turn ionizes the upper atmosphere of the Earth, uh, in, very much more so than it normally is ionized. And you get radio absorption, particularly in the high frequencies from about five to 40 megahertz over the course of a few hours as that, that sunlit side of the Earth is bombarded by the X-rays from the flares. Over the horizon radar is also affected by these uh, events and they can also put out a lot of radio noise so that you will in fact see uh, GNSS interference because the sun is actually putting out a lot of radio noise during flares in the GNSS bands. And this is uh, on the left you see during a particularly bright radio bright flare back in December of 2006 um, as the radio output of the sun on the lower plot there rises during the flare, all those GNSS stations on the sunlit side of the Earth uh, lost complete lock of all GNSS satellites. So that was an, a particularly loud, radio loud solar flare, we call it. Um, another event happened back in 2013 when the Swedish flight control radars, which were pointing right at the sun during the morning of August 17th, uh, were blinded by a radio flare and they had to shut down the airspace around Sweden. So solar flares are um, basically photonic in nature and they last for a few hours, <clears throat> but they can have these effects on communications in GNSS, which can be fairly severe. Um, moving on to the coronal mass ejections, these are the, the, the really the major parts of the eruptions that happen when the magnetic field lets loose on the sun. You can see there on the left a, a movie of an active region uh, didn't play very well, but it's throwing off huge amounts of plasma as that magnetic field reconnects. And, and that plasma and magnetic field charged particles flow out into the spa into space into what, in the form of what we call a coronal mass ejection or a CME. And the movie on the right here shows a, a very, um, a view from uh, basically near the earth where the, you can see the plasma coming off and then you can also see these, this snow on the camera of the uh, satellite. This is the SOHO satellite at the L1 Lagrangian point. That snow is, high, is um, highly energetic charged particles caused by the shock wave of the CME as it travels through interplanetary space. Uh, so coronal mass ejections can go in any direction from the sun. They don't always come right towards the Earth. And really one of the major challenges of space weather prediction uh, and forecasting is to determine which CMEs that come off the sun are coming our way and are gonna drive radiation towards the earth and or collide with the earth to cause geomagnetic storming. So really CMEs are the, uh, are the big drivers of radiation storms. The shock waves in front of the CME are what accelerate the particles. On the right, you see a measurement again from the NOAA GO satellite showing an event back in um, 2014 in which you get a very sudden spike in the, in the charged particle radiation out at the geo orbit here, it begins to decay, but then there's another explosion on the sun, another CME comes out, and it accelerates those particles even further. So this is one of those one-two punch kind of events where you get a lot of charged particle radiation accelerated by the CME as it comes off the sun and towards the earth in this case. Uh, the other thing that the CMEs do when they collide with the earth is they perturb the magnetic field of the earth. They dump a lot of energetic particles into the upper atmosphere, and that's what causes the aurora. So the aurora is really the only visible effect of space weather, uh, but it's a very good gauge of how big a geomagnetic storm we're, we're experiencing. The farther south you can see the aurora, the bigger the geomagnetic storm. So that's sort of our visible indicator of, of how big the CME impact on the Earth is. Um, you can see at the, the bottom of these points just point out that the radiation storms are really one of the major concerns for both uh, astronauts in space, humans in high altitude flight, especially near the poles where a lot of these auroral particles are coming down. Uh, but also um, they drive a lot of the, the geomagnetic effects in the ionosphere, which again can create disturbances in the ionosphere interfering with GNSS and radio communications. They also, by heating the atmosphere, driving these currents in the atmosphere, they cause the thermosphere, the upper atmosphere of the earth to expand um, and Sean will talk a lot more about the details of that and how it affects the orbits of satellites in low Earth orbit in particular. 
And finally, geomagnetic storms, when they drive the, the, the uh, magnetic field of the Earth in this complex way, actually create currents in the ground, the crust of the Earth, responding to the changing magnetic field. It's Ampere's law, basically. When you have a changing magnetic field, you can drive electric fields. Electric fields are generated in the Earth, which then uh, generate geomagnetically induced currents, as we call them. And these GICs in the Earth's crust can be picked up by the power grid and in very extreme uh, geomagnetic storms can actually destabilize the power grid, uh, causing blackouts as they did back in 2003 uh, in Sweden again. Sweden seems to get hit by space weather particularly hard. Um, the other thing they do um, when this geomagnetic storm hits is by perturbing the magnetic field, whoops, geez, sorry. Um, that's supposed to be a movie, but it's not playing. Anyway, um, the Van Allen radiation belts, which you see here in their sort of normal configuration of an outer electron belt and an inner electron and proton belt, uh, are, are generally very perturbed by geomagnetic storms and they can grow and shrink. Let's see if it plays if I click on it. There we go. You can see them growing and shrinking in response to the geomagnetic storming. Um, so that these are, the, the radiation belts are actually variable um, in, in their intensity and in their size and their extent. You can see here I've overlaid the, the different orbital regimes roughly, it's not exact, but in general, LEO sits below the second radiation belt. Um, and Janet will talk more about how uh, LEO radiation is affected by the changes in the radiation belt and incoming solar particles. But you can see that in general, LEO sits below that, that, that gap in the second radiation belt. Uh, the, the, the horns, as we call them, that come down closer to the Earth can be problematic for higher inclination orbits. MEO sits right in the middle of the radiation belt, so satellites in MEO have to be very radiation uh, resistant. GEO is in general outside the second radiation belt, but as you can see during extreme events, actually this isn't an extreme event, this was just a strong event back in 2015. Um, it can also have the, the second belt extend out to that regime. So finally, um, in terms of the magnetosphere and its effect in space weather, we can actually create uh, man-made space weather. This is an illustration of the Starfish Prime thermonuclear explosion at 400 kilometers in space back in 1962. Uh, on, on the left is a picture of the actual shot, and you can see it actually caused its own red aurora. On the right is a, uh, a measurement of the electrons, the energetic electrons in orbit. Um, you can see that it created its own artificial uh, Van Allen radiation belt of energetic electrons. On the bottom half of that plot is a, uh, a plot of the St. Patrick's Day geomagnetic storm that I showed earlier. You can see it affected the radiation belts to some degree. The Starfish Prime created this very artificial, very intense radiation belt, very low down. Uh, and at the time, in 1962, there weren't very many satellites in LEO, but two thirds of the satellites that were in LEO were either destroyed or damaged. Uh, by this man-made space weather, this artificial radiation belt, if you will. Um, so now let's quickly finish up with a little discussion of space weather from below. This is really propagation of waves and vortices from the troposphere stratosphere system, making their way upwards into the mesosphere, which is the layer of atmosphere between the stratosphere and the thermosphere, and all the way up into the, the thermosphere. So you can see here what we call orographic waves breaking over the mountains propagating up and causing secondary gravity waves, which can actually cause traveling ionospheric disturbances, we call them, in the ionosphere, again, interfering with radio transmission. You can see if you try to bounce a radio wave off of that ionospheric layer, hoping to reflect it down somewhere else on the Earth, it's going to be disturbed by that, uh, that structure in the, in the TID, as we call them. Similarly, thunderstorms, particularly in the equatorial latitudes, can generate their own very strong gravity waves which propagate up and can cause instabilities in the ionosphere leading to large scale bubbles or uh, something called a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which then creates very big voids in the ionosphere. And when you try to get GPS signals through these plasma bubbles, it's often impossible. They get scintillated as we call them, the phase gets shifted and you really can't receive your GPS signals well at all um, trying to travel through these plasma bubbles. So this shows that not only do we have to worry about the solar input from above, but there's a lot of activity in the lower atmosphere which can propagate up in the form of waves to cause space weather, uh, in the, particularly in the ionosphere, and interfere with communications, geolocation, GNSS uh, reception, uh, 
through these, uh, these instabilities. So that's really about it. This final slide is just an eye chart which shows on the top, the yellow, the solar magnetic cycle and its effect on the sun. And on the bottom in the blue is the Earth's uh, atmospheric cycle and its, and its major phenomena which impact various uh, effects in the, nat in the natural system in green, causing these impacts in the orange and red to, to uh, technological systems on the left and right. So that's really just a, a reference for you. But you can see what one of the ways to use this is to see that solar magnetic eruptions can cause solar flares, which can generate x-rays, which can generate atmospheric expansion, which can then have impacts on low Earth orbit uh, satellite uh, orbital trajectories, which can then lead to uh, un unexpected collisions when you have um, displacements that are unexpected in your satellite. So that's one way to use this chart. And I believe that's it. For more information, you can look at these uh, websites here. And I guess now we'll hand off to Sean for more information specifically on that atmospheric expansion and drag. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Tom, for that primer. Uh, I am just going to pass it over to Sean. Okay. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to stop my video to Go save bandwidth. I'm not alone at home, so <laughs> sorry. Okay. So I will give a short overview of uh, upper atmospheric variability, which is proportional to satellite drag. Um, it should go, I'll get you on the first one. Okay. So any object in low earth orbit loses altitude due to interaction with the neutral air particles. So the thermosphere that Tom mentioned, which is the altitude range between about 100 and 500 to 600 kilometers altitude. So satellite drag is uh, modeled using the equation in the yellow box. So we have the aerodynamic coefficient CD, uh, which represents the interaction between the atmosphere and the satellite surfaces. Then we have the area to mass ratio, so A over M, so the RAM surface of the satellite and uh, the mass. So that is something that sometimes you know, and sometimes, for example, in case of debris, you do not. Uh, we have the satellite speed squared with respect to a co-rotating atmosphere. And finally, the parameter that is very variable in this equation, the thermosphere density. And this comes from a model in, uh, in our case, of course, when we do the computations. Something happening? Ah. So any object, of course, in LEO ultimately will re-enter the lower atmosphere. And so what you see in this uh, plot on the right, you see the uh, altitude decay of two satellites in red is CHAMP. And one way to counteract, for example, um, this decaying altitude is orbit raising maneuvers. And so in case of CHAMP, this was done four times, uh, increasing the lifetime in, to a total of, of about 10 years. For GRACE, which was much higher, you see in the, in the blue line, you see the altitude is decaying much slower and there were no altitude uh, maneuvers executed over this period of time. Now, if you're doing mission lifetime estimates or remaining lifetime estimates, um, you need to know the solar activity. So sunspots or actually the, the solar EUV emissions. Um, and you need to have this as a forecast in for the next couple of months, years, and sometimes even solar cycles. Here's an example for a CHAMP, the decay prediction that was made about one year before it actually re-entered using two scenarios of, of solar activity. You see that uh, the blue and the red line, there's only about five, six weeks difference in, in re-entry time. This was an easy one. The satellite was already very low and we were in, uh, in the solar minimum of the, of the solar cycle phase. At the same time, the GRACE-1 scenario uh, was also computed, and here you see um, the very large uncertainty due to the solar activity forecast. So all these colored lines are different solar activity forecasts, and this large uncertainty then translates to almost 12 years of spread. Uh, so GRACE actually re-entered GRACE-1 in December 2018 and uh, GRACE-2 in, in March, uh, no, in December 2017, uh, GRACE-2 in March 2018. So it's the it's the green line that came closest. 
So thermosphere density, uh, the variability is a function, what is going on? Oh. Is a function of location and mainly as a function, uh, mainly a function of altitude. So the top plot shows you the exponential decay uh, as a function of altitude. Just note that uh, in this case, uh, we have almost six orders of magnitude in density between 200 to 1000 kilometers altitude, to, just to give you an idea of, of what is the biggest variation. And then secondly, we have latitude and longitude or a more natural coordinate is local solar time. And the bottom plot shows you uh, a typical structure of uh, density, in this case at 250 kilometers. So what you see is the density maximum sitting in the late afternoon and uh, minimum densities on the night sides. Then the variability is also a function of date in particular due to the modulation due to the solar and geomagnetic activity. So the solar activity that Tom showed you in the solar cycles. What I show you here is the solar activity as measured in the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. So that is the proxy we use for the solar EUV emissions, which we cannot measure on the surface. So that is why we use this radio flux. And at the bottom on the right, you see the geomagnetic activity, which is our proxy index for, for solar wind interactions with the magnetosphere. So you see this variability. This is semi log scale, this, this index. So uh, the 31st of October, that is, is a geomagnetic storm. So that is one of these CMEs that hit the earth. Then finally, we have variability due to season. So that is simply the fact that uh, uh, earth rotation pole is uh, tilted with respect to the ecliptic. And so we have uh, a summer hemisphere that receives more solar energy than the winter hemisphere and that translates to these two images in the middle. So the top shows you the model prediction of NRL MSIS of um, a temperature uh, typically for summer, northern hemisphere summer and the bottom southern hemisphere summer. So we have all these variations on, on different time scales. So we have the slowest and the fastest variations are actually the most important, let's say in size. Blue shows you again uh, in, the, in the plot on the right, the solar cycle. So of approximately 11 years, plus or minus one year or something. And you see already that the size of these solar cycles is, is not identical. And then in red, we have the fastest variations, which are due to the solar uh, geomagnetic storms. Uh, the duration of these events is of the order of hours to days, and these are depicted by the red dots. So what you see is the red dots are uh, severe geomagnetic storms. When the, the, the dots are above KP8, so above approximately the middle to the top. And so what you see is that these are actually rare events. Fortunately, the geomagnetic storms are rare events and the most intense ones, the KP9, so at the top of the plot, there are only 11 measured since 1970. All in all, if we take all these uh, uh, severe storms, we only have about a month or so of severe storm over this entire 50 year period of time. But the effects are quite large and we'll show it a little bit later again, how big this can be. Here is the effect uh, measured by Champ and Gray. So at 400 and 490 kilometers altitude for one of the more severe storms, you see an increase, what's going on? You see an increase of uh, five to six times the storm before the density within 12 hours. Now to put this into perspective, uh, so what is the impact of solar cycle effect versus geomagnetic storm effect. Here are, um, again, NRL MSIS predictions for um, densities from uh, 120 uh, to 1200 kilometers altitude. In the light blue line that is during solar minimum for geomagnetic quiet times. And the dark blue line is then the effect of a severe geomagnetic storms. And, and so the model predicts that density increases between 
four and six. And so NRL M series is mostly underestimated a little bit. Then to put this into perspective, here is the effect of the solar cycle itself. So this is a, a big solar cycle with respect to a small, uh, to, to a solar minimum. Here the effects are uh, like 15 times bigger at 400 kilometers to up to 90 times bigger at, at 70 kilometers. And then finally, if you compute again, a solar storm at this solar maximum, you get densities that are more than, that can be up to 200 or more times bigger than during solar minimum. So I did a, a quick simulation using the storm that is depicted in the bottom right. So that's the Halloween storm of 2003. Uh, so that's, that's, this is a KP9 event. So you, you see the, the, the three peaks at, at 400, that is the, the, the highest level of geomagnetic activity that we can measure. And so when I do this simulation for a, a spherical uh, satellite in a polar and uh, circular orbit at three different altitudes over a seven day period, you can uh, more or less predict the impact of due to the storm only. And so at 250 kilometers altitude, the effect is, is pretty important. Uh, four kilometers decay of the semi-major axis due to the storm alone. With respect to 14 kilometers of the total decay effect, keep that in mind. Then we go up to 500 kilometers and, and the, the effect of the storm is still only 66 meters. And at 750 kilometers, the decay is only five meters. Then if we take a, a slightly lighter object, so with a surface to mass ratio of uh, 0 0.01, both uh, that would be the order of a, a cube set of one kilogram and the other one a cube set of 10 kilogram to, to have some numbers. Uh, in the first case at 250 kilometers, this object would re-enter due to the storm. And then at 500 kilometers, the effect is like, uh, 670 meters and 750 kilometers, about 50 meters decay. So above 500 kilometers, the effects are, are relatively small. So as take home message, I would say, um, if it comes up. So we have order of magnitude changes in density over a solar cycle for altitudes higher than 300 kilometers. So if we're below 300 kilometers, these changes get a little bit smaller. But anyway, most satellites will not stay in, in orbit long below 300 kilometers in, uh, unless they have propulsion systems. So the solar cycle phase, the time of launch in the total solar cycle phase has a large impact on satellite lifetime. The density increases several hundreds of percent during geomagnetic storms within hours, what I've just shown as a measured case. Sorry for this delay here. <laughs> so the orbit decay can be significant due to a solar storm uh, of the order of kilometers for very, very low orbits, but it is not dimensioning for lifetime simply because these events only take a few days with respect to lifetimes usually of the order of years. And finally, and that is very important, geomagnetic storms cannot reliably, reliably be predicted at the present time. So there are many studies going on and this has been a, a subject of study for a long time. We are still not able to predict storms uh, more than a few hours out. And finally, there's, uh, this is a very interesting report to read if you're interested in, uh, in extreme events in space weather, not just drag, but everything that is discussed today. That is in this report, uh, we have the benchmarks of one in 100 year events. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you for working through the clicking there. I know we were having a couple issues. Um, so I'll pass it off to Janet and Janet, I think, you're just going to have to tell me to advance the slides, uh, which thankfully it's not working. seems to be pretty easy. Yeah, it was having a little bit of issues there. So um, okay. the floor is yours. And if you can just say next slide, I will happily advance for you. 
Okay, today I'm going to be talking about space radiation and how it impacts satellite operation. So let's jump to the next slide. So put really succinctly, space radiation can damage or degrade components, causing a complete or partial system or mission loss. And typically we talk about four different types of issues. The first is surface charging. So this is when electrons and protons from the environment collect on a satellite surface, charging it up to high differential voltages, which eventually can lead to a damaging arc or electrostatic discharge, which can then create an electromagnetic pulse that couples into your satellite electronics, putting it into some unusual state. The second issue is internal charging. So this is caused by higher energy electrons that instead of accumulated, accumulating on the surface can pass right into the satellite and build up on dielectric materials like circuit boards or on ungrounded metals. Eventually the charge can build to the point of a breakdown and cause a discharge that can damage sensitive electronics or again make a pulse that couples into your satellite and puts it into some unusual state. The third is caused single event upsets. These are caused by very energetic ions that can pass right through your satellite. If they happen to go through an electronic device, it can flip a bit that then requires some kind of ground intervention to fix or can cause a latch up and a complete device failure. The last is total dose. So this just refers to the slow degradation of components from the constant radiation dose throughout the mission or from a stepwise increase in that radiation dose, which ultimately reduces the lifetime of your satellite. Next slide. So the best solution to the problem is to design satellites that are impervious to the radiation. And there are a number of tools available that will allow you to estimate your satellite susceptibility most groups I know tend to focus on the last one there, total dose, using one of those tools listed, and may or may not consider the other three issues. Next slide. Even if you do consider all the issues, there's still a possibility that your satellite can have a problem once on orbit either because the radiation environment has exceeded the threshold you designed your satellite for, could be a, an extreme 100-year event, or it could just be that there was some unexpected design feature. And unfortunately, we don't have a process for tracking satellite anomalies, so we don't know exactly what this new generation of LEO satellites what type of anomalies they're experiencing, but we do have some estimate of what to expect based on past missions. So in LEO orbit, single event upsets and surface charging are the most common concern. The other two are less of an issue simply because they take a longer accumulation period and satellites in LEO orbit spend less time in the very intense radiation. Next slide. So once your satellite's on orbit, there's not much you can do to prevent anomalies from occurring. However, it is useful to try and understand if you do have an issue, whether or not it's related to space weather. And unfortunately, it's a complicated process and there is no single space weather indicator that can explain all of these issues. Each one of these are caused by different particle populations. They're enhanced at different times and in different locations. Next slide. So what can you do to try and understand whether space weather may have caused an issue for your satellite? We'll talk about single event upsets first because that's the most common in LEO. And there's a number of different particle populations that can cause this. Uh, first, there's a stably trapped proton belt, which in the figure over the right, if you could actually see it, would look like a donut wrapped around the Earth. What sometimes confuses people is that in LEO orbit, the bottom plot there is showing a latitude and longitude plot, 
So at a fixed altitude and in LEO orbit, this donut actually looks like a red bullseye. And that's just because where the magnetic field is reduced, it allows those protons to come down to lower uh, altitudes. The peak fluxes from this stably trapped belt vary only by about a factor of two over the solar cycle, but it's always there. So every time you go through that region, there is some probability of an anomaly occurring. And it's an instantaneous effect. So if you wanted to do some forensics and understand if an issue you're having is related to this stably trapped belt, you could use a tool like AP9 to define the location of that belt relative to your satellite along its orbit. Next slide. Maybe a more concerning issue for single event upsets are solar energetic particle events. So Tom mentioned this in the beginning. These are extremely energetic ions that stream from the sun. So they fill the polar cap regions. In this case, the Earth's magnetic field actually acts as a shield and it deflects those ions from reaching lower latitudes. So in that middle plot, you can again see the stably trapped proton belt that looks like a giant bullseye. And then up at the higher latitudes, you can see the effect of the solar energetic particles. These events can last days to weeks. Occasionally, they can be trapped and form a temporary new belt. And you may think that you have no issues with these SEPs. Um, with your satellites, but I just want to point out that we have had no SEP events since September 2017. So if you launched after that, your satellite is really untested. There's a number of tools for doing forensics to know if your satellite is being affected by these solar energetic particles. So first you can refer to the space weather prediction plots of GOES protons or the alerts that are sent out that will tell you whether or not there is an SEP in progress. It will, won't tell you if you're in the high flux or the low flux region, and we don't have great tools for doing that at the moment. One thing you can refer to is a report by the Aerospace Corporation called the Human in the Loop Decision Tool. And what it is is just a set of steps that you can work through to at least estimate whether or not you are experiencing uh, an anomaly due to solar energetic particles. And then in the future, my group is working on a tool that will allow you to track these different populations in real time and better understand anomalies. Next slide. And the last population that can cause single event upsets are galactic cosmic rays. So these are high energy ions that stream from outside our solar system from things like supernova. They are always present at higher latitudes at low levels. The fluxes don't change dramatically, but they are anti-correlated with the solar cycle. And unfortunately, we don't have good real-time tools for understanding if an anomaly is related to these. Um, the best you can do is to define statistical access regions from tools such as CREAM 96, which is what I had done a few years ago with my colleagues at EU MedSat and uh, an issue with the MedOp B satellite. Next slide. And then <clears throat> lastly, surface charging. This is caused by energetic electrons accelerated in the high latitude auroral regions. So this plot over on the right is uh, a plot showing as if you are looking down on the northern polar cap of the Earth, and it's showing you the regions where the SAMPAC satellite experienced high charging. And unfortunately, we have a bit of a gap here. There are not good tools for estimating surface charging effects. There is a tool that was developed by Aerospace, but it's not publicly available yet. So the best option here, again, would be to refer to this human in the loop decision tool to at least get an estimate if, estimate if your satellite is experiencing this issue. Next slide. And then just a quick uh, 
slide here on extreme events there the u.s is working on a space weather action plan to define radiation benchmarks for extreme events they've already gone through phase one and there's a report listing uh, some extreme event flux values for SEPs as well as GCRs and work is underway now to refine those benchmarks and deliver a phase two report. Next slide. So that's all I have for today. Uh, just to summarize, there's four different issues to be concerned about regarding space radiation, surface charging, internal charging, single event upsets, and total dose. The two major concerns at LEO are single event upsets and surface charging. Single event upsets have three different populations that can contribute to that type of anomaly and surface charging is most likely in the high latitude auroral regions. And I'll leave it at that. Wonderful, Janet, thank you so much. And we'll come once again now to Matt. Uh, Matt, I'll advance the slides again, and okay. thank you so much for All working right. well, through good, good morning and good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm going to present a slightly different look at space weather um, from my perspective working in a company that runs small satellites. Um, so I'm going to try to touch on some of the challenges, but also touch on where the opportunities are um, and where SPIRE thinks it can make a contribution into this field. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so for those who don't know SPIRE, uh, we are a small satellite company uh, and we build and launch a large constellation of 3U CubeSats. Um, and philosophy of the company really underpinned by, by a couple of, couple of points. One is that what we're trying to do is target, um, target situations where having many more observations is important rather than having very large expensive science grade uh, sensors. So we, we like to have small sensors but lots of them. Um, and then also to try to make everything very reprogrammable on orbit so that we can, uh, once the satellites are in space, then we also have opportunities to um, upgrade, replace software, um, change how the satellites are, are working. It's pretty much a SPIRE product all the way through. So we design and build satellites in Glasgow in the UK, um, and it's almost all entirely um, SPIRE produced now. Uh, and that's really good for us because it allows us to make changes, allows us to innovate and modify things uh, very quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said, we operate three U CubeSats, um, and that's traditionally, historically, I say historically, the company was founded in 2012. Uh, so it's uh, still quite a young company. Um, we're beginning to look at some six U CubeSats as well, but, but at the moment, everything we fly is three U CubeSat. Uh, we've launched over 100 and there are over 80 still in orbit. We designed them uh, for a pretty short design lifespan uh, and that's important. We'll come back to that. So two to three years realistically. Uh, we've had many launch campaigns with lots of different launch providers. One of the advantages of CubeSats, as I'm sure most people know, is being able to work with lots of different launch providers um, fairly easily. Um, and as well as the space segment, we've got uh, over 30 ground stations distributed around the world in order to try to get data down quickly. Um, so the system gives us pretty good global coverage. Um, there's a mix of orbits, uh, some launched from the ISS, some, uh, some synchronous orbits, some uh, mid-inclination, but they're all operating between 400 and 600 kilometers. So it's, it's low LEO orbit. Okay, go on, please. And uh, the focus is really on things that we can do with signals of opportunity. Uh, it's much easier to put um, receivers on small satellites than to try to run transmitters with uh, large power requirements. So at the moment, uh, the primary uh, payloads are threefold. One is a GNSS receiver, uh, which we can use for radio occultation to feed into weather forecasting systems. 
Uh, one, uh, we can also use that to sense the ionosphere, um, both above the satellite, but also in, in an RO uh, sense, looking down through the atmosphere as well. Uh, and we can use the GNSS for uh, slightly more novel things, such as uh, looking at surface reflectometry, where we can uh, sense soil moisture or ground roughness, looking at the reflected GNSS signals. Uh, the other two missions are, again, both software radio defined. So there's an AIS receiver, which does uh, ship tracking and ADSB receiver, which does aircraft tracking. And then one area that's really emerging uh, over the last year or so is to open up the platform into uh, looking at hosted payloads and orbital services where we can fly things for other people if they if that's what they wish. Next slide please. Okay so I'm not going to uh, go through this very famous Bell Labs picture uh, because the other speakers have done a good job of describing um, all the problems, the many problems that space weather can present to people. Um, but I, um, so, but I, just briefly, I'm going to split up the effects into uh, three different areas um, where, we, where we have to worry about these things. One is ionospheric effects, and that's primarily from a radio propagation point of view. Uh, one is thermospheric drag, uh, that Sean spoke about, and radiation effects that Janet spoke about. Okay, next slide, please. So let's take a look at each of those in turn. Um, so atmospheric effects, which is really my background, um, so I apologize if I get uh, the other domains entirely wrong. Um, we have to worry about yeah, all, all, all radio systems that are operating through the atmosphere, which operate below about two gigahertz have the potential to be uh, affected by the atmosphere. Um, so from a, sat, uh, from a satellite operator's point of view, uh, the main issue there is, is potential impact on the VHF and UHF uh, communications between the ground stations and, uh, and the satellites. Uh, scintillation is likely to be constrained to equatorial regions um, or, and possibly in the aurora regions. I have to say this is not an impact uh, that we've really observed uh, much, if at all, uh, and I'm part of that is because we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle and we don't necessarily expect to. Um, the other place that that's going to get mitigated is, as uh, on our roadmap, is transitioning our comms to higher frequencies to get uh, higher bandwidths, higher data rates, um, and as we go up in frequency, the atmospheric effects are going to become less and less. Okay, go on, please. Okay, now, as I said, each satellite carries a dual frequency GNSS receiver, uh, and that gives us uh, opportunities here to actually measure the ionosphere and try to produce products for other people. Um, so uh, first off we can do direct measurements of the ionospheric scintillation so that's the, the issues that may cause us problems but we can also sense it ourselves. So on the right here there's a picture uh, showing uh, some data from a, a radial cation geometry uh, and we can see there are periods in the bottom panel there are periods where the signal is fairly stable at the start from uh, 0 to 100 seconds and then it moves into a scintillating environment where we see rapid variations in the signal amplitude in this case, but they'll be associated, also associated with rapid variations in the signal phase. Um, so we can use the GNSS receiver to actually sense these um, and uh, use that to provide situational awareness for other users where this becomes important. Next slide, please. We can also use the rate of occultation uh, data to do high resolution sensing in the lower atmosphere. So there are techniques that have been developed um, which are in the literature which take the uh, essentially the data that's being used for the MET community. Uh, so it's high rate 50 hertz uh, data and we can construct uh, high resolution. By high resolution I mean vertical resolutions of about 100 meters uh, in the lower atmosphere. So this is it's quite high resolution. Um, and the example that uh, you can see here is two different measurements. Um, one, um, or two different measurements collected from different receivers and from different transmitters. So they're fully independent measurements, uh, quite closely located. And we can see that barring the, the trends that we haven't quite taken out, we can see the same sort of perturbation of about 105 kilometers in, in both of those. Um, and actually having the access to the constellation is important. I was 
I, I've seen lots of these sorts of plots where you see little glitches and nasty things occurring in Yara and you think, well, is that really real? Is it a problem in the receiver? But it really is, it really is real. We can demonstrate it with different receivers uh, using different transmitters co-located and see, see that these things are really, we really are sensing the environment. Okay, next slide, please. And then we can also sense the wide area ionosphere. Um, so using these measurements, we can um, measure, uh, we get integrated measurements from the GNSS transmitters, the receivers. So we can actually use those within the data assimilation system combined with other data as well, other space data and other ground data in order to um, produce uh, global maps of what the ionosphere is doing. And again, uh, use those to derive products for other users in a very similar way to the MET community will provide uh, or try to provide the best possible representation of the neutron atmosphere and then products can be derived from that for different users. Next slide please. Thermospheric drag is clearly uh, potentially a challenge. Um, we are in a low orbit and as Sean shown uh, those low orbits were affected by thermospheric density um, and we're relatively low mass. Um, and uh, we know that if we start looking at orbit propagators, then actually uh, the drag is at those altitudes, primarily the, the, the largest dominant factor in orbit propagator error. Um, however, um, this is also an opportunity in the sense that um, we need that drag in order to meet the UN deorbiting requirements. We don't have active, uh, we don't have active deorbiting, um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we fly so low is that we want to be uh, we want to be good players in Leo and get the satellites out of orbit uh, within the UN mandated time periods. So um, for us, the, the thermospheric drag on the on the long term is really important to get those satellites back out of orbit. Next slide, please. It's also an opportunity in that we can sense thermospheric drag. Uh, because we run GNSS receivers and we need precise orbits in order to do the radio occultation, uh, we can actually use those precise orbits to uh, characterize the thermosphere um, in near real time. Uh, now there's, um, uh, again, there's work in the literature that looks at taking um, pod information, precise orbit determination data uh, and turning that into me direct measurements of the integrated density over fairly short periods of time. Um, and you can see an example on the, on the right here. Don't read too much into the fact it, it's um, jinking about so much and is so different from MSIS. This is a very naive um, implementation at the moment of uh, some work in the literature. Uh, we're not taking into account really the ballistic coefficient or changes of attitude in the spacecraft. Um, but we can we can see that uh, we we can um, we can make estimates of density that are significantly different different from MSIS. Uh, and then we can take data from across the constellation uh, and use uh, various different uh, estimation techniques to try to uh, use the whole constellation in order to come up with a best fit thermosphere uh, across the globe. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, radiation, uh, Janet's just done a good job of um, sending us the problems with radiation. Um, I would contend, well, uh, I'm gonna say in Leo, where we are at say four to 500 kilometers, it's a relatively benign environment. Um, it would be uh, significantly more difficult if we were at two and a half thousand kilometers or 3000 kilometers, um, but it's relatively benign, uh, which means the satellites can be designed in a way that does not necessarily require huge amounts of hardening on each satellite. Um, and the philosophy here is really about putting in a little bit of redundancy on each satellite. So certain systems might be redundant, but in a three year CubeSat, you haven't got much scope for doing uh, lots of redundancy on each spacecraft. So there we try to take the view that the redundancy is mainly across the constellation. Um, so rather than building lots of redundancy into a small number of platforms, um, we build redundancy across the constellation uh, and if you're a customer of Spire, if you're buying data from Spire, 
you're not buying data from a particular satellite, you're buying data from across the whole system. Um, so from a customer point of view, uh, you know, we, we, we try not to be dependent on individual satellites uh, making uh, measurements at any real particular time. Okay, next slide. I think we're reaching the end. Okay, so we have challenges, we have opportunities uh, from a, a range of different space weather effects. Um, I like to think we've got more opportunity than challenge. Um, and I think some of that comes down to the design philosophy of the constellation, uh, where it is, how it's been designed, short lifetimes and so on. Um, and actually having the constellation uh, then gives us big potential for really doing uh, wide area characterization of the atmosphere and thermosphere. Um, and that can obviously uh, be used to support different operational systems and also to increase forecasting capabilities because we can sense, uh, we can provide input into data simulation models where uh, we just don't have the data from ground sensors. Okay, I think that's me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, appreciate it from Spire's perspective. And so uh, with that, let me just get out of this screen share here and we can bring all of our lovely speakers back up for a bit of question and answer as we've got about 10 minutes to go uh, in our allotted time. But um, I just absolutely wanna thank you all for your presentations one more time. They were you know, in, enlightening for the, for the space weather nerd that I am. And uh, I, I just wanna kick off with uh, answering one of the uh, most answered questions, most asked questions thus far, most upvoted uh, has been, will the slides be made available? Uh, yes, right at this point there, it's an extremely large file because of all of the different uh, little video features. And so we have to uh, do a bit of trimming there, but I will, uh, venture to get that up on the Secure World's website in the next week, uh, along with a recording as well. That was another very asked question. So thank you very much all for, uh, you guys figured out how to use the upvote feature and you used it par excellence. Um, but I'll, I'll just take the, the, the chair's prerogative for a moment and ask uh, one of the questions that I had uh, that kind of sparked from hearing Tom and from Sean and from Janet um, was that, you know, there's a, there's a very strong image of space as a void, space as empty, um, and that's even one of the reasons why satellites are talked about as better than air platforms for different types of, uh, of research and remote sensing and things like that. But the environment that you all described is, is very much more dynamic than that image would display. So um, if you were a satellite operator dealing with your specific issue, maybe Sean about um, drag and, and Janet about radiation, what would, what are the things that you need to um, be very acutely aware of, not just for extreme events, but also for the day to day? I think you did a good job explaining it generally, but tell them just maybe in one or two sentences what you think that um, the most specific thing is. Hey, me first then. <laughs> um. I would say if we're not talking about extreme events, uh, it would be like choosing uh, the altitude for your specific mission. Like if you need a mission lifetime of a certain number of years, uh, you need to find a compromise between satellite altitude and also, for example, your launch date. Like if you're launching uh, in the uh, rising phase of the solar cycle or uh, close to the solar minimum, it is not at all the same phasing. You will not have the same lifetime. So that those are things you can think about if you have that luxury. Sometimes you just have to launch and there's no way out. And you just have to launch higher or, or lower if you want to stay within the 25 year uh, reentry limit, for example. I think that's the, 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 the main not extreme event thing to think about. Thanks. Janet? I would say that day to day, uh, that the space radiation is probably manageable, but it concerns me a little to hear Matt say that the environment at LEO is benign because it is until it isn't. And a lot of these events are very sporadic uh, 
And my concern as an operator would be to have a very large SEP event that overwhelms the limited redundancy that you have so that you suddenly lose contact with a large percentage of your satellites. And if that happens at the same time, which is likely that there's drag issues going on, now you've lost contact and you don't know where your satellite is. So there's two compounding issues to consider. Sure, okay. Um, Tom, did you wanna jump in with anything there? No, that was a good summary. I think it is important though, okay. as Jed said, to keep in mind that these are compounded events. So at the same time, you're getting a very high radiation dose from an event, you could be experiencing drag, uh, you could be experiencing GPS and GNSS uh, communications and locations issues due to ionospheric effects. So space mm -hmm. weather comes all at once in a variety of ways, not just in these little discrete pieces. Sure. So, and I think I'll, I'll direct, there is a, a, a question from the audience similar to a question that I had for you, Matt. Um, is basically, the, the question from the audience says, you know, what does SPIRE do to protect its satellites? from radiation, which, you know, we don't, not asking you to get in anything proprietary, but um, I think that leads into my question, which was basically, um, you know, Spire seems like to be a pretty established small satellite company. I know you said since 2012, uh, you know, it, it seems like a short period of time, but I think operating that many satellites with the experience you have, it makes you stand out, especially in comparison to university CubeSats or first time CubeSat operators. So. My question along with that is, um, d does a, in order for a small satellite operator to be conscious of space weather and to be working on making it an opportunity and addressing the challenge of it, do they need to be more established? Or is this something that you think that, uh, you know, Spire and others could be doing from the, the get-go? I think you have to do it from the get-go, but you have to do it in a way that works within the business model that you're trying to establish. And I think that's going to be different from a commercial operator to a university operator to a government operator. Um, but, you know, what we can't do is, you know, in case for you, CubeSats in lots of lead, um, and we have to make choices about where we fly and how we operate the satellites and how we select components and which bits are hardened and redundant and which are, are not. And I think you have to look at it as a as a whole. You can't you can't build a small satellite. You couldn't you couldn't enable uh, Spire's business model if you were building um, large fully hardened satellites. I think that's fair to say. And I've I've been involved in projects in previous jobs where uh, you've got customers, funders who might have an opportunity to fly one satellite and, and there, you know, the questions all become very different again because at that point they really want that one satellite to uh, work and work for a long time. And again, it changes all the, it changes all the equations about how you balance the risk across, um, across what you're trying to do and how you're trying to collect and deliver the data because fundamentally we're trying to be a data company uh, providing useful data. That's what it's, that's what it's about. It's the, the, the space component is something we have to do to do that. Okay, all right. Um, I'm seeing a question at the top uh, that is similar to some others that have been asked is basically, um, this has been a good resource, but if you're a, a small satellite operator, where do you go to look for more information about space operations. Tom, is it, do they enroll at CU Boulder? Uh, is that the answer? Is it that simple? Janet, do they pay for space hazards to, to do things? We do have, uh, a, we are developing, we do not yet have, but we are developing a professional uh, certificate in space weather at CU, so that's coming, so look for that. I put some resources at the end of my presentation, some websites that can get you started. There are some textbooks out there. Um, they tend to be more phenomenologically focused. So they talk a lot about the issues I talked about at the beginning of my talk about the sun and its effect on 
the magnetic field and the atmosphere of the Earth and less focused on the technological impacts and the operational impacts that Sean and Janet and Matt touched on. So the, I think there is a gap here that does need to be filled. We, as I say, we intend to try and fill some of that with our professional uh, certificate. However, in terms of textbooks, I think it's right now and the situation is you have to go and collect a lot of different uh, materials to uh, put together something like you've seen here today, which spans everything from phenomenology to impacts. Mm -hmm. Janet? I'd agree with Tom. I think there's a gap and a big need for a textbook that just would collect all this information together in an easy way to understand and implement. Um, there are, there's NASA Handbook 4002A, which gives a lot of guidance on how to design satellites to deal with space weather. Um, another option is there's a seesaw meeting, which was supposed to be in October, but was canceled. So next year, uh, and it is a collection of scientists and engineers specifically talking about space weather impacts and what to do about them. All right, uh, and I'll, I'll also think of directing people, uh, Tom, to your former place of employment, the Space Weather Prediction Center, uh, their website. They've tried to put out a lot of uh, products and dashboards for if you're a different type of operator, maybe you're an aviation company, maybe you're a satellite operator, you're a grid operator, and what kind, you'll, you'll get to see a dashboard of what kind of uh, effects you would be interested in knowing about. So if you're, you know, drag issues and radiation issues and things like that. So that's a good resource as well. And I'm, and I'm seeing we have about just about a minute left. So I just want to go around um, to the panelists and if there's any last word, if there's any other way that people could uh, reach out to you and or a final message. So I'll, I'll go in order. Tom, anything last to say? Um, not much. Just thank you very much, Josh. This has been a, a real pleasure and, uh, and I learned a lot too. <laughs> Fantastic. Sean? No, not, not much to add either. So thank you all for, for listening and maybe next time. Okay, great. Janet? Uh, no, thank you for having this. I think someone asked about emails and I'm happy to answer any other questions if there's a way to get emails out. Okay, I can uh, stay tuned to the, uh, to the event page on Secure World's website. We'll make some connections there uh, and share out people's info so that people can connect more. And Matt, the, the uh, most yeah. prescient word, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for organizing and thanks for having us. Um, I will one day get to small site in person. I've never actually been, so one day. Indeed, we'll, we'll all see each other, I'll see each other next year. So thank you all very much. Thank you to our 104, 103 participants that are still out there. Um, thanks for sticking through with us. Looks like we had a total of about 160 people earlier. And so I, I appreciate your engagement. Thank you for answering, asking all the great questions. Uh, and we'll stay in touch and continue to watch the Secure World page for a recording and for the slides and contact info. So thank you all and have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday.